All right, then we'll just begin. I'll say a hearty J Meherbaba to everybody today. Mm -hmm. um, hold on to your hats. <laughs> Try to, oh, it's a lot to absorb. Um, we really had a good time putting it together. Uh, uh, this well, all right. The story of Oceano Dunes goes goes way back. It's a it's a but and actually it's a city and it's a, a, a state recreational. The dunes go for miles and it's a state recreational area. We you can you can still drive on those dunes and um, and. Uh, uh, but way, well, you know, I think I'll just jump in. Uh, I'm going to play a video by a man named Norm Hammond, who uh, is really a uh, key to this whole, uh, to our, our research, the research uh, of Oceana Dunes. Um, and uh, at, because we had such short notice to put this program together, we and the thought was that he has so much to contribute that we'd like to get him to do his own uh, his own separate program. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm going to show you today is uh, is excerpts from his video um, to give you a little bit of the history of, of Oceano, of Oceano Dunes. Oceano is a town just south of Pismo Beach and also this m miles of dunes um, uh, that's state state recreational area, I believe is the term. Okay, find it. Okay, this is Norm Hammond, and uh, I, I'm, he tells a bit about himself. I, I'm just I'm going to skip that, and you'll just hear him narrate. Um, well, I'll tell you, he he on a motorcycle trip, he discovered Oceano basically and fell in love, and uh, after some time, he's he 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 lives there now, and he uh, sort of dedicated himself to. Uh, documenting the history of this place. So I will go, here's his, I'll go to his narration of uh, the Chumash Indians, who were the really the first uh, residents. Of course, with the Chumash, they were in this area for a very, very long time. I see uh, recently down off the Channel Islands, they found what they call Arlington Springs woman, 13,000 years old, and they're having to rewrite a lot of things they previously believed about the earlier inhabitants of the American continent. Uh, this is one of the Chumash middens that's in the dunes. This is very big, it covers about a half a square block, and there's artifacts and chippings, and of course a great deal of shells that you can see here. Uh, that was one of the staples for the people who lived here on the central coast. This is Clam Digger Belly. He was one of the locals that commercially harvested clams. There was a time period when you could get a license and commercially harvest them and sell them. And that's what he did. You heard me talk about Edward C. St. Clair a little bit earlier. This is the fellow here that's in the front page of the face of the clam. Uh, he was a Spanish-American War veteran, came into the dunes sometime after the Spanish-American War and lived there until the time of his death, which was around 1923 interesting thing is his cabin that you see here. He's kind of utilizing whatever's at hand and his smokestack he has a little downdraft diverter made on the top out of an old tomato can. Or he wrote a, a book called uh, Wind Woven Rhymes that he published a small book of verse. I'm I think I'll stop here the, uh, and go to the uh, this is kind of the, the next he talks about um, uh, oh, never mind. It's so close. I'll just continue. Always been interested in some of the different ways they, they built the places that they lived in. This is down by Point Sal. I don't know who this fellow is, but it's kind of interesting because it's the only two-story dune structure that I know of. This is Hugo Selig. Uh, went into the dunes right after the First World War. He was disenchanted with the state of humanity at that time. Uh, lived there in total solitude for many years. He wrote a book of verse that's interesting. It's The Wheel of Fire. It was published in 1936 by the uh, Oceano Round Table Press. This is the Lagrandi Pavilion. Uh, there were three pavilions on the central coast. Uh, this was the uh, largest and the most ornate. 
two stories. On the bottom was to be um, boutiques and gift shops, uh, land sales office, uh, and, and all that sort of thing because they had planned a city to be erected in the dunes called La Grande. And this was going to be the center of the city and this was about two miles south of Rio Grande Creek, which is the southern limits of Oceano city limit. And you can see they're dragging the lumber with horses. This is back in the horse and buggy days. They had a pump station uh, with electric generator to make lights for this uh, pavilion. The top story was a dance floor and had a grand piano. And this was a, quite a grand undertaking that ultimately failed. This is opening day, 4th of July, 1905. And as you can see, it's all horse and buggy. They had lights strung all, all across the top. I guess when it was lit at night, it was pretty impressive with the lighting in the front of this thing. They tore it down for scrap. It fell into dis disuse. And uh, the interesting little side story there, I guess I'll tell. They, they built an auto court out of the lumber. This was all first class lumber in Oceano. And I came along years later as a training officer for the fire department on a burn, a training exercise where we were going to burn this whole thing to the ground. And I stood there with the flares in my hand with the engines running and the guys all ready to go with their hose lines and stuff. And I was, it was explained to me right then that this was made from lumber from this pavilion. Well, instantly my mind, I'm thinking I'd like to take some of the better pieces of wood and I don't know, build a little liquor cabinet or a coffee table or something from this wood because it's historic wood, if you will. It, it just wasn't happening. They were ready and all these people and I put a torch to it and watched the whole thing go up in smoke. So, one of those things. This is the set of the um, Ten Commandments. Interesting thing in the face of the clam where they rounded up some of the regulars uh, in the dunes to use as extras in the movies because, uh, you know, they had a, a cast of thousands and uh, that those people would go to the movies to see themselves in the silent movies. Of course, it's a cast of thousands and here's the, uh, you know, exodus from Egypt and all these. The guy said, that's me. Can you see me? And of course, to see your faces, you know. <laughs> but, uh, so some of them did get part-time work. And this is uh, from the top of the mound where the set is today. This is a fellow named Slim. Everybody had nicknames. I talked to him. Composite Slim. That movie, Ten Commandments, was Cecil B. DeMille's first, uh, the first silent movie. And that whole set was buried uh, in the sand, what you saw the picture there. Um, oops. Uh, <clears throat> um, sorry, but he, uh, and as, uh, if, the dunes are, are miles long. Oceano is the north end of the dunes, and at the south end of the dunes is Guadalupe. Um, excuse me, I'll stop sharing here. Um, is, the, is the Guadalupe dunes, it's called. And um, so that set w was buried right where they, right where they filmed it. Uh, it was a silent movie. So... And you, you said it was mile, the dunes were miles long, they like it, five miles or 50 miles oh, or 50. Uh, I wish I knew I, I, there might be somebody here who does. It's more like maybe, maybe a little more than five. Gosh, I, I don't have that. No, it's not 50 miles. No. It, uh, Betty, if you're, if you're wondering, maybe you can ask Valerie because she knows all about it as far as the details of the area and you don't live there. So maybe she could go into it a little bit more. Well, she, she's uh, here, so. Yeah, how do you feel about that? Valerie? I don't know what the distance is between Guadalupe oh, well, forget and that the then. Dunes, but it is continuous. And yeah. the Guadalupe dunes are preserved, so there's no vehicles on those dunes, but Oceano is a free-for-all now. So uh, I'm not sure. Ma Sam, Mar I'm Margaret not. just looked it up. And uh, okay. I guess it's 18 miles long. Oh, the dune, okay. the dunes are where the they're called the dunes. Called the yeah. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you, folks. Thanks, folks. Okay, that's our answer. <laughs> All right. I think at this point we will uh, go to the Rileys. Um, Tom, Tom. Uh, 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 
the, uh, well, I'll just let talk, Tom and Kathy tell that story. That, uh, they're, hi. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, so Kathy, will you, oops, I'm not hearing you. Let's try again. Okay, so let's see. Yeah, if, there, yeah, yes, good now. No? Yeah, okay. yeah, okay. yeah. <clears throat> Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Uh, setting up this connection to the dunes in Tom's life, he put an ad in the paper his sister did for weekend work when he was still in grad school in New York and a man with a strong Hungarian accent <clears throat> answered the ad and needed help packing up his home in Woodstock. And Tom went over there. What was his name? And his name was Raul Vidas. And yeah. Tom, a yes, a Hungarian violinist. There's a whole amazing <clears throat> story about his, you know, his early life. But since everybody, we have lots of people adding wonderful snippets, I'm going to have Tom read. Uh, from the section in which Tom was asked to help pack the library. And this is... Where do I begin? And then we're starting right here. So Tom was packing the library of a vacation home of Raul Vidas and his mom in Woodstock in 1954. Shall I begin? Mm-hmm. I now return to my work with Raoul and his mother in Woodstock. The movers from California were expected in a week or so, and my work would be to help in this process of packing up their belongings. My very first task was the boxing of books in a large library room. <clears throat> the library was sizable and several shelves high. Using a ladder, I would take perhaps six to eight books at a time and place them in their box. At one moment of transfer, as I placed a particular stack into its box, I was confronted with a photograph on the cover of a 9 by 12 inch magazine. The portrait... Uh, just, just one minute. Sorry to interrupt. This is a, an early photograph of Raoul, young Raoul with his father. Uh, Raoul played the piano as well as the violin. So this is just a, a historic photo we found of young Raoul. Tom met Raoul when he was in his 50s many years later. So this is, you know, fast forward to 1954 when Raoul was, let's see, he was born in 2001, I mean, 1901. So that's, um, yeah. So that was, he was 53 at the time Tom met him. Okay. This portrait in black and white presented the most extraordinary face, a face that seemed to contemplate reality beyond time. Below the photograph were the words, Meher Baba. It was the face of a most extraordinary man. This face had once demanded my total attention. I was strangely encompassed with a familiarity and recognition of this image which took hold of my entire psyche. It was such a revelation to me. I was overcome with amazement. This was a photo of a man in his 40s in a seated position wearing a dark shirt jacket with buttons but most amazing but most amazing was his full black mustache mm -hmm. and long dark hair 
falling upon his shoulders. He was facing toward the left, his eyes open and contemplative. I was overwhelmed with the desire to know more about this person. I opened the magazine and was right away informed about Mayor Baba and his pathway toward self-knowing. My anticipation to discover more was immediately and significantly fulfilled after I approached Raoul. As soon as he saw the cover of the booklet, he smiled enthusiastically. <clears throat> Quote, You've discovered Mayor Baba, he exclaimed, and at once he began to tell me about how he had come to meet him. And then Tom is shares about Raoul having been invited to pick fair in 32 and meeting Baba there and that's a whole wonderful story uh, at, after Raoul shared that this is what he shared with Tom next at this gathering in July of 1932 some of the important people in the film would attend this event, actors like Charles Lawton, Marlena Dietrich, Cary Grant, and many others. Raoul met Mayor Baba and instantly admired him. Discovering Mayor Baba was a fulfillment. In 1934, when Baba was once again in Hollywood, he invited Raoul to join him and others on a motor tour through regions north of Los Angeles. Raoul was thrilled at the idea of accompanying Baba. The group spent a period of time at an artist's colony north of Los Angeles called the Dunes or Oceano. After dinner one night and having gathered with Mayor Baba and the others, Raoul returned to his cabin. Soon he visited, he was visited there by one of Baba's close ones. This person told Raoul that Baba would be pleased to have him come to India for a specific length of time, if he could afford that time and as well could afford the expenses of doing so. However, if this were possible, there would be two specific conditions required of Raoul, of Raoul in order to actuate the trip. He must not smoke cigarettes and he must not have any sexual experience with women for a specified period of time. The Mondali, these are the close disciples. This Mondali said he would return in the morning for Raoul's reply. Alone now in his room, Raoul pondered the proposal. Giving up the tobacco he could definitely do, but abandoning his connection with women for that time would not be possible for him. As he conveyed this story to me, he appeared virtually saddened. V visually. Visually saddened and wiped a tear from his eyes, saying, I was young and undeveloped at that time. I was unaware of the golden opportunity which had presented itself to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that, no? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. There in Woodstock in the fall of 1954, 
I had found Meher Baba, and this discovery would lead me soon to his physical presence. So that's Raul Vidas and the Dunes and Meher Baba. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you, Kathy. That was wonderful. <laughs> what a wonderful connection. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, now next we skip back to the dunes, the dune, dune time. Uh, Cassandra is going to talk a bit about a magazine that, that this dunite community uh, put out. Cassandra? Thanks, Betty. So, you know, I think it would be better if uh, Sam went first. Oh, good. All right. Let's do it that way. Is that okay to do it that way? And then I'll show them the form later. It's a good whole picture. You're right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Sam. So, hello. Yep. <laughs> Jay Baba. Jay Baba. I have the uh, film. I'll share it when we're, when you're ready to show it, but why don't you tell your story first? Oh, thank you. Sure. Yes. Um, first time I became aware of the do nights at all. Um, lived in California for many years, obviously, but um, really never heard of the Do Nights. One night in the 1990s, I was watching television, and uh, so I happened to tune into this um, show that I seldom watched, Ewell Hauser's California Gold on uh, public TV, and um, <clears throat> KCET is the channel here, and I was watching it, and he was talking to these people who had, oh, driven stagecoaches and various things. Um, and he would travel California and find these kind of little hidden gems of culture and art and various things. <clears throat> and so in this uh, one segment, he said, oh, now we're going to talk about uh, the do nights. And I'd never heard of them, so I was sort of curious. And he showed all these sand dunes and things. And, uh, and so I was watching. And then at some point, and he's discussing all the very interesting uh, oddball characters, artists, creative types who both visited and lived in the dunes in these houses that were built literally on the sand. And uh, at some point, he says, OK, now we'll show a photo of the Dunites. And here's about 10 or 12 people, you'll see the photo, um, pops up. And who's standing right in the middle of it? But the avatar of the age. <laughs> and Gil Hauser doesn't know who Mayor Baba is. So he says nothing about him whatsoever. He just says, oh, yeah, there was this guy here. And he used to go naked all the time, except when he went into town or whatever. But he talked about the different kind of characters that live there, um, but didn't mention anything about this guy, Mayor Baba. But I almost fell off my chair. I, I just, I mean, I really felt like I did. I felt like that's incredible. And a whole day um, not to know about this. Up to me. Have this North suddenly of happening in front of me. So, anyway, that's my, my introduction to uh, the Dunites. Hey, Baba. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Excellent. Thanks, Sam. I'm going to show it in a second. If people wouldn't mind staying muted while we show the film and while others are talking, that would be good. That helps out. All right. Here comes the film. Let's cross our fingers that Cassandra does this right. Can you see that? Is everyone able to see it? Betty? Yes, it's great. Okay, good. That's good. When you first see them, you're overwhelmed by their size and their beauty. These huge sand dunes, which go on for miles up and down the central coast. 
Now these are part of the Oceano Pismo Dunes, located about 15 miles south of San Luis Obispo. I was brought here by Norm Hammond, a local resident who's done a lot of research on a group of people who over 60 years ago used to live in these dunes. They call themselves Dunites, and they actually built little shacks and cabins right out in the dunes and call this place home. They were artists and writers and poets. Some of them were mystics. and they actually built little shacks and cabins right out in the dunes and call this place home. They were artists and writers and poets. Some of them were mystics, and some were people who today we'd call hippies. During the 1930s, they were in their heyday when Gavin Arthur, grandson of former U.S. President Chester Arthur, moved here, built a little community called Moy Mel, and started publishing a literary magazine called the Dune Forum, which contained all sorts of writings and poetry inspired by the dunes. Celebrities from W.C. Fields to John Steinbeck stopped by to visit with the Dunites. And even though no more than 30 to 40 people ever lived here at a time, it was a thriving community made up of real characters. George Blaze was one of the uh, more interesting characters. People uh, called him Frenchy, and that was due to the fact that he was a nudist. Uh, all the pictures you see of him, uh, he has wearing nothing uh, except for a loincloth, and that was what he wore to go to town in. That was his oh. dress-up uh, clothes. And uh, he lived on raw wheat. That was his diet. And he made, uh, he'd go to the, the store there in Oceano, the, uh, where they sell feed for livestock, and he would buy these 100-pound bags, and he would bring them out here, and he'd make them up into cakes, and that's what he lived on. What did the townspeople think about these Dunites? Well, they, they thought they were odd. Well, the Dunite community flourished through the 30s and 40s, but by the 1950s, things had slowed down considerably, and it wasn't much longer before the colony, its people, and its buildings completely disappeared. Sounds like the end of the story, doesn't it? But it turns out that Norm, through over 20 years of painstaking research, had located the last living Dunite. His name is Elwood Decker, an artist who lived in the dunes for over 13 years. Now, Elwood's not only alive and well, but spry all get out. And on this very special day, he took us on a journey through the dunes back in time. Well, most everybody um, lived close enough to uh, walk to the other person's place. Uh -huh. There was a nice sociability. I mean, we uh, there we didn't have any. We didn't have much money, but a little money went such a long way. God, for a quarter or a dollar, you'd have a terrific party and ever invite everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was during the Depression, and what it meant was a life of freedom, uh, a purity uh, of uh, habitat, uh, a freedom of food, the fish in the sea, and... Uh, uh, you could make a garden, have any kind of vegetable you wanted. The water seeped from the, l the lakes under the sand to the ocean. So digging usually three, four, five feet, you had a fresh water well. Okay. There's more of that film, and it's it's all pretty interesting. I can uh, leave it queued up, and if you want to see it later during the question and answer period, I'll show you more of it. Um, but I, I hope you enjoyed that. It was so charming to see that old guy. <laughs> what was his name? Elwood? Talking about it, and the way he talked, and, and you could feel the poignancy of his memories for that.
So he mentioned about, or um, Hugh, Hugh mentioned about the Dunites um, having a magazine. And let me cue that up. I wanted to show you just, I'm going to paste into the chat window because I don't know if I want to spend a lot of time on this. <clears throat> I'm going to paste the uh, the link to these six copies of the um, the Dunes Forum, which is the magazine they put together. And the purpose of it was to kind of give a voice to uh, conversations about opposites. And uh, there were a lot of famous people who participated in that magazine. So um, let me show you a couple of those. And do, 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 do. Okay, well, I pasted the, uh, I lost it, sorry about that. I pasted the link in there, but you can see in the, in the uh, magazines themselves that people like uh, Ansel Adams, he contributed some photos and uh, um, there were a lot of famous visitors. Betty, help me out with this. Edward but, Weston uh, was another, Edward, the photographer. Uh, yeah, a lot yeah, of famous writers and everything, yeah. So rather than go through all that, I don't want to take up a lot of time here. We have a lot of people who have a lot of wonderful things to contribute. So Betty, why don't we go ahead? All right. Um, we have Valerie um, McKean next. Valerie, uh, we owe so much to her incredible depth of research on this subject. Oh, she you. and, and uh, Naurishawan collaborated on a, uh, an article in 2005, an extensive article uh, on on the GLOW. So Valerie, I'll, I'll, I'll get okay. you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Jay Baba. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about after Baba's visit and also about Sam Cohen, who was, who invited Mayor Baba to come to the dunes and uh, he was living there in um, a small shack south of Moy Mill. Um, and Baba did come on, um, we're pretty sure it's December 26, 1932, and spent the night in the dunes. Sam Cohen um, stayed like in the dunes. He left briefly for um, to go to Chicago because he thought that Mayor Baba was going to be at the World's Conference of Religions, but he hopped the freights back and came back because Baba sent him back to the dunes. Um, so he was living there after Baba's visit, um, having incredible experiences. So I'm gonna read from, to you a letter that Sam wrote to Elizabeth and Norena this would be in 1935, um, probably around the time that Mayor Baba was at Mount Abu. And so writing to Elizabeth and Norena, he says, Carl just brought me your letter. I am now at Moimel. We are expecting Gavin back in a few days. I came to Moimel because experiences were so strange that I felt my job was just to stay at Moimel. To say that experiences were strange here since July 10th is putting it mildly. Of the details, I will not speak, that's my secret, but Baba is here in the dunes powerfully. I always knew and suspected the dunes 
really is the world's battleground in many ways. And now I am convinced. The dunes are the hub and the center of the universe and here all forces fight for supremacy. And it's strange, but I know they fight to capture him, the elusive one, the Lord, the Rose, or truth. One name is just as good as another. Strange, but the whole life where with Baba at its head seems to come down from some mysterious mountains, floods through the dunes and then vanishes. So we must capture him. Because of these great events, we are almost anxious to hear news of Baba. Obviously, I feel sure he is in the mountains of the Himalayas and moves through the ether as the Lord himself. It seems to me to keep out my own personal experience that the whole world passed a decisive stage and the new cycle is in full force. Hugo is elated. But we keep our respective worlds, so we are strangers and foreigners. I tell him nothing, and he tells me nothing, and that suffices both parties. I wish Baba would move me along a little. I tried to leave the dunes since July 10th, but I am rooted to the spot, and so I feel I'm here to stay. Carl sends his best wishes, and tells me to tell you that he would very much like to see you here in the dunes. Arthur Alman is here and he brought by a sailboat here on display at Gavin's. It's a beauty, full rig, complete in all detail and ready to sail the seven seas. Yo-ho-ho in ho, a bottle of rum. He sends his regards. Hugo is probably meditating. He went on a diet. I think he feels Nirvana is around the corner. Dunham Thorpe and little Ella are here. Dunham is the chef of Moy Mel, both sends regards, and of course, John Doggart. So Baba is in India, you in Europe, and I am in the dunes. So I'll juggle the idea of neither time nor place. Baba is in the dunes and you are in the dunes. The dunes win. We have captured Baba. Do you think that Baba will still be in retreat or back at the ashram? Have you any news? Please let me know by return. Well, I'll close here. My love to all and of course from all in the dunes, Sam. So Sam had left his cabin and was staying in Moimel. In October of 1935, something happened to him and he had wrote to Baba and said, at my shack, a few negative experiences happened. An obsession for so I think it was took place. And I broke a few windows and found it impossible to sleep at my place. Too many other forces have been interfering and I think it's better to stay here at Moy Mel than my shack. So Sam continued to stay at Gavin's cabin and in 1935, October 21st, he telegrammed Baba saying, staying in the dunes is difficult. I'm going to New York to visit my family. Do I have your permission? So Bob again cabled back and said, yes, you can stay with your family. So Sam went back to stay with his family. He worked at his, with his family, had a kosher sausage plant and he worked there much to his chagrin. Um, he didn't like that kind of work. And, uh, but he had to do it, it was the depression. So he continued living in New York, but his health got in the way and no longer permitted him to work at that profession. So somehow he stayed in New York and then of course he went to visit Baba in, 
Khan and then also stayed at the ashram. Um, Baba asked him to uh, go into the cave at Panchchani and stay the night and he said no. So Baba sent him on. And then um, that was in 1937. And what happened between 1937 and later is that Baba sent him to Mexico. And there's many letters on the trust website where Sam is writing to Baba saying, okay, I'm here in Mexico. What am I supposed to do? I don't know what to do. I mean, the people seem nice, but what am I supposed to do? And Baba wrote back saying, I don't, I don't really care what you do. Just stay in Mexico. But um, in the 40s, a friend of, he was back in the States, and a friend of Noreen and Elizabeth had a 200-acre farm in South Canaan, uh, Connecticut, where he stayed uh, living in a tent and camping. And uh, he wrote to Baba saying that he had a plan to conquer Maya and completely eliminate all sanskaras for all time. So he felt like he had his work cut out for him, I guess. Um, so Sam ended up eventually in 1958, um, he was reunited with Baba at the Sahabas in Myrtle Beach. Um, and also in 1958, Mayor Baba directed several people to fast for 40 days. And Elizabeth was told that Sam was to quit his job. And if he could not quit his job, um, if he was to ask for a leave, I'm sorry, and if he could not get a leave, he was to quit his job and Elizabeth was to take care of him and put him up at the center. I believe he actually stayed in the lookout for those 40 days when they were only allowed to have milk. So, um, and I know, I think Tom, you might, did you meet Sam at the LA, up at the, um, center, or did you meet him at the New York group? Did you meet Sam in Myrtle in 58 or in? I think so, yeah. And also in 62? Yeah. Mm hmm. Yes, he has a whole story about, about Sam and two other men going to see Baba in 62. Right. Um, so, you know, are, we all, I didn't think when I was writing this article that the dunes that people would still be communicating with Baba or going to the dunes. But in 1942, well, first in 1941, Jean Adriel, Gavin had remarried. He'd remarried a woman named Esther Murphy and they were living in this very nice big house up on the hill. He was no longer, coming, living in his cabin in the dunes. Um, and people would stay there from time to time. So uh, Jean Adriel actually stayed in the dunes in 1941. She, it was right when she had changed her name to Adriel from Schloss. And she wrote to Baba and she said, as you can see by the above address, I am here in the dunes where you and the group once spent a night on a visit to meet Sam Cohen. I remember you said at the time that sometime later I would come to the dunes and here I am. And she writes on, oh, she says that here in Gavin's cabin, we speak of you often. She was there with Alexander Markey. I need not tell you, um, then she goes on for quite a bit about her personal relationship with Alexander Markey. Um, so she spent time in the dunes there and uh, so did Consuela and 
Marina came to the dunes in 1942. They had spent a lot of time in Fairfax. Uh, Elizabeth and Noreen had taken a house in the Hollywood Hills. Those of you who know the Hollywood Hills, it was on Queensway. Quite a lovely big house. But Consuelo and Noreen, they took, and I believe Hilda Charlton, who was also staying there for any of you who know Hilda Charlton. Um, and, I'm going to read just one little excerpt from Consuelo's letter to Bob. In, this is in April of 1942. In Oceania, we stayed with Esther and Chester Arthur and visited the dunes and Dr. Gerber drove us to your little hut, which we found filled, almost filled with sand and half destroyed. The dunes are marvelous and we loved our pilgrimage. I think it's interesting that she called it a pilgrimage to the dunes. Um, Marion Thorpe is a most unusual and curious case, which no one can quite understand, of course. But now that you are helping her, she will be all right. She was very sane when we saw her, but of course it is hard for her to adjust to the reality of this life. Fortunately, her little boy helps her keep her balance. So that's about all I have on Sam and the dunes in the forties. Betty, unmute, please. Yeah. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Valerie. I so appreciate oh, your your uh, your attention to great detail. You know, I realize uh, I didn't finish my my bit my bit about history. Uh, there's a piece that's pretty important. Uh, in 1932, Baba sent uh, no. He'd had his, his, now Valerie, please correct me if I'm not, I'm kind of winging it if I'm not quite right about the order of things, but, but he had had his uh, receptions and met people in Hollywood. Uh, and then uh, in 1932 summer, he sent Norena Machiavelli uh, and Meredith and Margar Margarita Starr, uh, and others, you know, I'm just going to read. I'm going to read. Well, I could tell you a little bit okay. if you want to right. that um, Meredith Starr was underfoot in Hollywood. And so uh, he, Baba sent Meredith and Margarita Starr to the dunes. And uh, Gavin wrote about her later saying that, you know, she was quite lovely and, you know, what a wonderful woman she was. Um, and then when Baba deferred breaking his silence in 1932 at the Hollywood Bowl, uh, Norena and Elizabeth went up to the dunes and they all pitched together to build a special cabin for Baba. But he did not it was his 1934 visit that he visited the dunes finally. And it was a, my understanding was at this point that Meredith and Margaret Starr went uh, uh, kind of what would you say left went on left Baba. He they didn't did he Baba had instructed them to go back to England and instead they stayed in the dunes. Um, they stayed in the dunes and then they went back to England and started another retreat, not dedicated to Maribyrnong. So that's a very important piece. I mean, the fact that Baba had set this up two years previous is just so interesting. Um, so now we, um, having come up to the 1940s, um, I wondered if you wanted to talk about the Face of the Clam at all, which was published in 1947. Oh, sure. I could talk briefly about it. Um, I actually have it right here, the Face of the Clam. Uh, hard to come by. I think it's been republished recently. 
Um, Luther Whitman, Whiteman, uh, lived in the dunes for a while. Um, he and Samuel L. Lewis, who's also known as Sufi Sam to many people, uh, published a book in the 30s called Glory Roads. It was about the history of uh, politics in California. But in 1947, uh, Luther Whit Whiteman wrote this book, published this book, The Face of the Clown. It is a very satirical um, report of a Swami coming to the dunes in it. Uh, a lot of it is about the Dunite culture, about being arrested for poaching clams and living on the, a carefree life on the beach and the philosophy. But it's interesting, this one little paragraph, if I could read it, Please. about the news that a great Hindu teacher had come to the dunes to start a new movement spread rapidly along the beach and in the villages of Pismo and Oceano. It was an endless subject among the clam diggers and chicken matchers. The small colony of occult students in Oceano who years before had built a temple to their master Hilarion were divided in their opinions. Some members of the colony were certain that the coming of a Swami was proof that they had long contended that the dunes were the center of a powerful, of powerful occult vibrations. So um, that's the book. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting because, you know, you can imagine that someone like Mayor Baba coming to the dunes for these people who were interested in philosophy and theosophy and all kinds of ease. Um, it was very exciting for them. It was a big deal when Baba came to the dunes. Yeah. I, um, before we jump into more contemporary times, uh, uh, I wanted to ask you, Valerie, uh, um, Sam went to India actually, right? At, uh, it, it, right. He did. And when was this? In 1936 or 37 at that time period that the ashram was established. So a bunch of people, Garrett Ford, other people were in India. And then they went to Khan and um, I forget the order. Maybe someone else knows of what they went first. But he did go to India. And was it a, do you know how, what the period of time? I don't know how long his visit was there. Okay. All right. I'd have to look it up, but. And then he returned. Uh, he uh, went from there to Europe and from Europe uh, to Mexico. Okay. Oh, I see. I, I just came across this funny little quote by Adi about Sam, if it's okay, I'll just read it. Oh yeah, please. Uh, Adi said, uh, uh, Sam Cohen stayed in the dunes and built a small shack in one of the coves and settled into a simple life of reflection and meditation on Meher Baba. As Adi K. Arani noted in his diary, Sam was an exceptionally ascetic type of man with no regard for clothes and sleeping bag. He wears a sweater and covers himself with newspapers at night. So, uh, and this poor man was, was a kosher butcher. <laughs> That well, that's what he was trained as. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Betty. Yeah. Betty. Yeah. Yes. Betty, I think Alan has something to contribute. Oh, good. Okay. Alan, did you uh, want to say something? No. I I'd like. Not. Yeah. Um, were we in order here? I thought Karen was going to be before I. No, I thought that you looked like you were trying to say something. I thought. No, no, I was just laughing at. Okay, no worries then. The Alan, it's it's actually your turn next. You and you Talbots are gonna now. Are you gonna bring us up? Well, you're, first of all, I guess Karen's gonna talk about Ella, or maybe you two. I'll let you two figure it out. But it, well, Ella's. Uh, oh, oh, go ahead. Um, first. Did Betty? Betty? It's Judy. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if I could ask a question before we go to more content temporary times. Okay. Does um, either Valerie or anybody else here 
can they tell us more about what Baba actually did during his visit to the dunes? Um, he spent the night and uh, that's all that's been said, but do, can anybody share? Do, is there any knowledge of that? There is something in the Lord Mayher that I had found that Baba actually gave interviews during the day that he was there uh, to some of the local people. Uh -huh. And it sounded to me, there wasn't much detail, but it sounded to me like he was actually meeting people from the town and not just the do nuts. And then it said he took a walk on the beach and then headed for Santa Barbara. Did you know anything more, Valerie? Um, sure, I'm just looking at, um, I think one of the most, to me, one of the most striking things about Baba's visit to the dunes is that, you know, um, Gavin Arthur was uh, he was a bit of a, uh, he had wild parties. And uh, you can say it, he was a sexologist. He was a, he was a sexologist. That's a good way of putting it. Thank you. Um, so when Norena got to the dunes, uh, she insisted that uh, Baba have a pure cabin built for him to be free of sanskaras. So you see these photos of Sam and everyone pitching in. Sam said it was amazing how they pitched in together. You know, to see these people from diverse backgrounds, you know, out there with saws and, you know, putting this cabin together. When Baba arrived there, Marina said, and this is your pure cabin. He said, oh, no, I'm not staying there. I'm staying in Gavin's cabin. So um, Baba spent a lot of time with the Dunites, you know, explaining to them. One of them had a question about um philosophy um there was a disagreement among the dunites whether uh about the goddess kali and the entire community at one point became engaged in the debate and adi noted in his diary that baba spoke to hugo about the conflict he had in his mind and explained the three call qualities known in Sanskrit as rajas, tamas, and sattva, which is desire, ignorance, and truth. And so Baba spent time with these. And then at some point, it was freezing cold, and Baba was cold the entire time he was there. Um, he did give uh, a discourse, and I have no idea where that discourse is. But he did give a discourse to a group of people. There was a pandal set up for him. Uh, well, this this was also the time that uh, the Tom <coughs> Tom Riley's contact Raul was. Uh, he had this. <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, the the connect the communication with Baba and I'm sorry <coughs> about. I'm going <coughs> to, I think you know what I'm talking about. <coughs> Excuse me. It's okay, Betty. It's okay, Betty. We got you. <coughs> um, Baba told Raul Vidas that he needed to, well, the quality, um, that he needed to straighten up, basically to go to with the party to India. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I also wanted to mention two things. Dr. Gerber, Dr. Rudolph or Rudy, they called him Gerber, uh, who was an Oceano, he was the physician in Oceano. He uh, he was a pair, he uh, he was the physician for the Dunites too, and would take chicken or vegetables or he would he would treat them um, essentially pro bono. <clears throat> They considered him the patron saint of the dunes. And, you know, I do believe that Ella Thorpe actually lived with the Gerbers for a while. Um, he really took in people and uh, he never charged money if they didn't have money. And he's the one that drove Baba 
Baba went to his house and then he drove Baba to the dunes. <coughs> so Betty, why don't we go on to the Talbots and we can do more of this during the Q and A period. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, first Karen of all, yeah, 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 Karen uh, or Al, however you guys work. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Say Baba, everyone. Um, in 2011, um, Sue Jameson uh, came to, um, I guess we heard about it from her at Meherana that year, but I'm going to read something that was put in um, our local Meher Baba Center of Northern California newsletter in February 2012, but we're going to go back a little bit to 2011. And Sue wrote about her experience of finding out about Ella, who was the little girl, the six-year-old of Dunham and Marion um, Thorpe when she was a child. So Sue titled the article, and Sue can't, we, I, we asked Sue to be here, but okay. turn out the light, I'll read it. So Sue said it's 2 a.m. in Australia right now, so she knows that I'm going to be reading this today. And here's what Sue wrote. I had known Ella casually through the YMCA where I work. She attended the senior aerobic class two to three times a week for many years. And other than passing pleasantries, I really did not know much about her, except that she was a successful writer of children's books. Physically, Ella is a small woman with kind eyes and features that suggest an inner serenity. And I always knew she must have had an interesting life. The local library and the YMCA have a lunchtime Meet the Author series where local authors come and talk about their books. In this literary rich Bay Area of San Francisco, it is not uncommon to find oneself sitting next to a Nobel Prize winner or a Pulitzer Prize winner at the local coffee shop. I don't think it is an exaggeration to say that most Every, everyone knows someone who has written a best-selling book or is writing a book of some kind. I had noticed that Ella's name was listed as a speaker talking about her latest book, Dune Child, and presumed it was another children's book. Unfortunately, I can never attend as I teach during the time it is held. It wasn't until one of my co-workers, knowing that I was a follower, said to me after the meeting, Oh, too bad you couldn't come. You would have enjoyed her talk. She talked about meeting Mayher Baba. I almost choked on my lunch and resisted the temptation to scream, What? Instead, I said in my calmest voice, What? Then, as I learned more, it all became clear to me. Dune Child was Ella's recollection of growing up as the only child in the Bohemian Collective Beach community on the California coast known as the Dunes. Her book includes wonderful memories of her childhood growing up among artists and writers, many of whom became famous in their respective arts, including her parents, John Steinbeck, Edward Weston, Upton Sinclair, and others who visited the community off and on. The dunes are known to Baba lovers because Meher Baba visited there in 1934 at the request of Sam Cohen. I immediately contacted Ella and confided that I followed Meher Baba. Her eyes filled with tears and she wistfully said, I will always remember looking into his eyes. They were the kindest eyes. I still remember it all so vividly. At this time, Sue writes that Ella was 83 years of age. She was happy to know that I knew about Meher Baba and absolutely delighted to be invited to speak by the Baba group. 
She said she had not had any contact with any other bottle lovers, except for Nashuan, who had contacted her recently. She told me that meeting Meher Baba was the most significant event in her life. I gave her a photo of Baba around the time she would have met him. She was most grateful and said she did not have any photos of him. And Sue writes in parentheses, she certainly does now. I continued to have contact with Ella to set up a meeting date and the other arrangements. She was so happy and grateful to be able to share her memories of meeting Meher Baba with us all. Baba was and continues to be special to her. In fact, she says she has vivid dreams of him and feels he is watching over her, and that makes her feel very loved. Just after she spoke to her group, Ella and her husband moved from Berkeley to Santa Cruz, and she has not been well. I am so glad Baba gave us all the opportunity to meet this delightful lady and hear her Baba's story in person. I highly recommend reading Ella Thorpe Ellis's book, Dune Child not only for the wonderful account of meeting Baba, but also for the fascinating look into the political and cultural history of California during the Great Depression, set in a place that was unique, J. Baba. And I still have on, my, on our copy of the book, I still have the heart that Sue Jamison placed there because she was selling these books and she wrote Alan and Karen paid. So we got this at the Meherana Sahavas and we all started reading. I think there's like one or two chapters in here that deal specifically about her meeting Meher Baba. Um, so yeah, I wanted to share that. And now Alan can share a bit about um, the meeting and anything else. Jay Baba to everyone. This meeting has been an absolute pleasure. And thank you, Sue. Well, the, f the first I think we heard of all this, beyond what Karen has described, where Marana and, and Sue had, uh, Sue had um, just gotten a book and she started reading the chapter, Dune Child, uh, that dealt with Baba. And that's right. Rainey says she called him Baba, but I would get to that in a second. In any event, the... Um, so we were all gathered around Sue under the pondal at Mirana, and she was reading this chapter, and it was very exciting. So we, got, as Karen said, Sue got her to come and talk to our meeting. So she came to our center. What was interesting in meeting this lovely elderly woman, now, of course, we're all elderly, but um, from my point of view, she was elderly at that point. I was young, really. Um, we have a platform where speakers and musicians could play. So we, it was placed the length of the room for some reason. Um, and so a lot of people sat in front of the platform. Actually, I was able to put my feet up on the platform. It was pretty tight in there because we had so many um, people coming. And she sat on the stage by herself, on the platform by herself. Um, I want to mention that for years, Nashawan, who's here, had asked me, he said, I'll come out to your house and we could drive down to the dunes for the day and then come back. And I used to laugh. I said, Nash, it's like 300 miles. I said, if we come down there, we have to stay overnight. If we go down there, we have to stay overnight. And he would always go, oh, my schedule's so tight. But eventually we did get to the dunes, but that was later, um, which perhaps I'll have a chance to talk about. But anyway, Ella was talking. Nobody really knew her. What was interesting was that she lived right in the neighborhood, but didn't realize until she met Sue and conversed on this, that there was actually a Baba group. Um, and the, the El, our El Cerrito Center is probably like two miles from the YMCA where Sue worked at the time. Sue's back in Australia, as Karen mentioned. So Ella talked, it's hard to say, maybe an hour and a quarter. And she was, as mentioned earlier, the only child there, I think she was six at the time that Baba came, who she called the Baba. 
Although I don't think that was uncommon in those days. And reading other people who are not close Baba followers, I noted that people would call him the Baba. And that's how she knew him, I guess. And she recalled as she sat there, she described the vivid dreams that Sue mentioned in the uh, letter there. But as she was talking to us, she was reliving the experience, which she said was unimaginable of being with Baba, who was there for about a day. And she sat next to him, as I recall, for about an hour, which seemed pretty good to me. And maybe he sat on his lap. I'm a little vague on that. Um, perhaps Rainy or Karen knows that a little bit better. But either way, it was such a reliving of her as she was telling us and talking to us. Um, it was quite remarkable. One of the things that I found really fascinating was she talked about how the princess, namely Marina, and the Tribune lady, namely Elizabeth in her mind, um, were so wonderful. And that the Tribune lady, uh, who was about nearly, not quite 40 at that point, got down on the floor and read books to her. And she really enjoyed that. Um, and I found that quite fascinating, the idea of Elizabeth who I knew obviously was a, from 1971 to her passing in 1980, pretty decently sitting on the floor reading books to a child, but um, she was younger then. I'll, I'll, I'll add to that in a moment, but somewhere along the line, I think Vern Stovall was taping this, but perhaps I'm wrong. Um, it was a wonderful talk and we're all enter being entertained remarkably. She said her best friend was Ansel Adams, the world famous, photographer, uh, and she would walk in the dunes hand in hand with Hansel. You know, she was a little girl. She was the only child there. So things are moving smoothly. Everybody's enjoying themselves. And all of a sudden, about three quarters into this talk, she has this unimaginable coughing fit. And at first I thought, well, this is a Betty Loman coughing fit. But it continued in a very powerful way. And I, I was looking around the room. As I say, I was sitting at the left side of the platform, my feet up on the platform. And I'm thinking like, do we have any medical doctors here? Because this thing's not going well. And I looked to my right and there was Doug Ross and uh, Evan Buscar, who were chiropractors, the best we had. And I thought if this lady doesn't stop coughing or get some, um, some help soon, this is gonna be a bad scene. <laughs> I'm thinking like, <laughs> what kind of thing would it be if she actually died or had a heart attack at our center? <laughs> and her husband, now her husband was seated about four feet away from me. He was on the, facing the platform on the left side, completely un unconcerned. And, and I'm passionate about the whole thing. He seemed uninterested. And I thought like, wow, he's the husband, he should do something. Well, anyway, eventually she, pulled up her, her pocketbook and took out an inhaler. Apparently she had chronic asthma. I don't know what the reason was. Gave herself a few shots and was fine and continued to pace to finish the story, which I think will leave uh, everyone in the room quite a bit. <clears throat> uh, after she uh, was done and she got a very warm reception, as you can imagine, as I'm describing, um, I did talk to her and I, I told her that the, uh, I gave her a little bit of fill in what happened after she met Baba that one day, which was December 26th, 1934. It came to San Francisco, by the way, um, and then traveled up to Canada on the train. So he had to go through all the counties in California, um, including Contra Costa, where I live. Um, but anyway, I told her who the Tribune lady was, that she wasn't really the Tribune lady, which was okay, that was her understanding. Uh, Elizabeth was from Chicago. I think her mother's side was the Armour family, the Meat family, which works well with the same Cullen part. <laughs> and um, um, and filled her in for about 10 minutes on who these people were and what happened to Baba. She found it very interesting, but she really had lost touch. And again, didn't know there were any Baba people let alone a Baba group like in her neighborhood. Um, sadly, she, she moved to uh, Santa Cruz, would have enjoyed her coming to meetings, as Karen said, within a very short period of time, 
And then within a year or so, I think she passed away. Um, we did, um, I, I wanna mention one thing that I was asked to say by someone who couldn't be here, namely that the dunes, the, the area down there is terribly windy. When we were over there in 2017, Karen and I and uh, Sam and Margaret and Linda Zavala who's here and, and uh, Nashawan, um, I mean, it was blowing. I mean, it was gale storm type wind. But the person who couldn't be here asked me to relate because he had done some research that where the dunes was, it was kind of um, quiet. That it was, it was a kind of in a, a valley type area. Um, we, we went to Oceano actually and um, tried to find out. Margaret and Karen went and talked to some cabbies to see if we could actually go to the spot where the dunes were. And the, the guy said it was, they have ATVs and all kinds of chaos um, there and it'd be hard to find. And um, that was kind of disappointing in a way, I think to us, but we realized we couldn't go on the beach. We were about two miles north of where the actual uh, Moimel was. Uh, one of the things we found out at one of the museums we went to, we went to the, a, museum in the wrong place to begin with the five of us or six of us that um, somebody mentioned, I think it was Betty, that Ben-Hur was done in 23, the silent movie. And this is interesting. I, they didn't deconstruct the set. They just left it there. And so the wood that was used for the um, set was ultimately used for firewood and for building housing in Moinell. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, anyway, I'm trying to think of other things, perhaps Karen or Rainey, if she has a memory, has uh, more information about Ellis. Alan, I just have to, uh, you mentioned the Tribune lady. I, I This is now on Tony Zoyce's website. You uh, this, this incredible car that Norena and um, uh, Elizabeth were in. It's a. They got, in, they got stuck in the sand, by the way. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I think I think Noreen had her, all her jewelry on. And I'm just going to share the, the photos of this. It's a 1929 oh, okay. Stutz. This is this is a bit of a. It is a digression. Sorry, but I'll, <laughs> just quickly, I'll, it's just incredible what these ladies went went about in here. Uh, where are we? Here, Google Chrome. All right, share. <laughs> they and this was them, Narina and Elizabeth, in 1932 in this car. Yeah, it's a, it's so, so, oh. website. Yeah. And this, uh, but this is uh, this is Sam Cohen in sitting in the cabin being built uh, for Baba in 1932. Okay. Sorry, folks, I, this is just a diversion, but we, uh, okay, so I, we- uh, Hey, Betty, Betty, can you show uh, the picture? Betty, can you show the pictures of the girls again, please? Real yeah, fast. yeah. Go, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was too fast. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Oh my <laughs> gosh. That's fabulous, Betty. Thank you. It's, oh. it's on Mayor Baba Travels. Take a, it's Oceano. Yeah, it's, it's on the website, Tommy. Yeah. Uh-huh. Just maribabatravels.org. <laughs> yeah, aren't they just beautiful? <laughs> when we went, we went to the uh, dunes. Um, no one's talked about that quite yet. The six of us. Oh, there's two uh, yeah. oh, Actually, wait. Oh, uh, here's here's the, the the order of events. You guys are you are. You, this is okay. A good time to talk about that. We're kind of in current day now. Then Donna Lynn will talk to us about how she uh, had the cabin moved. Maybe, maybe we should do that first because you came later, right? Your visit. Well, <laughs> and then Buzz, Buzz and Ginger who had to stay at Oceano because of the Thomas fire. They had to leave their caretaking spot at Mayher Mount. They stayed at Oceano for three months. So, uh, they, so they've got some stories to tell too. Okay. Um, I'll finish off about Ella first and her book. Uh, seeing as the overview gives you some setting to Ella and her book. 
a pardon a minute, what, what is it that gives you? The setting of Ella, the incredible discovery of finding Ella in right. her and the setting of her book on subject. Yes. We were talking about Ella and discovering oh. her and how incredible it was to have somebody come to our center and speak about the barber. Right. First, and the barber coming there and taking her hand and taking her for walks and talking to her and her listening to the talks. Yeah. Tune Child is a book by Ella Thorpe Ellis, a compelling memoir of growing up in the Great Depression, falling on hard times. Her father, he was an agent for silent movie stars and her mother, a beautiful creative woman, migrated to a bohemian collective beach community in Central California. Frequent visitors to the resident artists included 20th century notables, John Steinbeck, Edward West and Upton Sinclair. Thriving as the only child among supportive adults, in this memoir, Ella Thorpe Ellis tells the story of an extraordinary upbringing in a bountiful, natural and human environment. And what happened with the book was rather awkward. Her family, after she'd written it and even been picked up as publication, objected to the story. They sort of saw it as some type of odd thing in their family's past that they didn't want all the details made public and it was revised afterwards. So this earlier book that Alan and Karen have and that Sue had bought then later up to Maharana after she spoke at our group in detail, um, is quite, quite, kind of a gem to have hold of. It's before the editing took place. But she was a remarkable person and her memories when she would go into that part of her life was so succinct and detailed. And she was such a special person. And I never use that word about anybody. She obviously at a, at a departure point in her childhood had such an extraordinary experience once Meher Baba came to the dunes despite all the other important people um, that she could recall astonishing things at the talk at, at, at Meher Baba Center in El Cerrito um, mm. after meeting Sue at the YMCA. Jay Baba. Thank you, Randy. That's good. That's great to have that additional, yeah, focus. Thank you. Um, so are we ready for Donna Lynn? Yeah. Donna I, Lynn, I'm sorry I didn't call and make sure you were up. <laughs> <laughs> are you there? I'm, there I am. There you um, are. I'm sorry, I can't get the photo in. I don't know what's wrong. So uh, you'll you just get your video. Okay. You'll, you'll just have to listen. We'll imagine you. <laughs> so um, Valerie, can you remember what year it was that you and I went up and we met Norm when all this started? <clears throat> Valerie? I'm thinking it might have been around 2002 or 2000. Does that seem about right? You had to listen to me talk about Oceano for about three years. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure the exact date. Do you know Margaret or Sam? No, they wouldn't know. Um, well, anyway, you know, Valerie was doing all this research and I heard about Norm. I think I read his book. And um, we decided to go up there and we met Norm and we went for a, a walk around the dunes and then he showed us where the cabin was. And it was actually not far from where it is today, but it was across the big road, the big highway there. And we went there and it was behind a fence so we had a look through the slats of the fence and we could see this cabin. And um, so then I'm not sure, was it that day that we went and had lunch with the, um, the wife and daughter of, uh, was it Griot, the real estate agent? Guyton, Linda Guyton. Guyton. <clears throat> So we, we had lunch with them and the husband who had recently died was really interested in having this museum. So I'm trying to remember. So then I went home and 
I'm sure it was because I, I called a title company and I was able to locate the owner of the property where the cabin was. <clears throat> and I got his phone number and I called him and he was the nicest person in the world. Um, I don't remember his name. He told me he was 77 years old and he had this cabin, which I don't know if anyone said this so far, but it was supposed to be burned down. And Norm at the last minute decided to save it when he was a firefighter and they were using these cabins for training exercises for firefighters. So he saved that cabin and then it got moved onto the property of this man who owned it. So anyway, I told him, well, the Gaitans were interested in moving this cabin to another site. And he was so nice. He goes, oh, that would be wonderful. The cabin was being used by a group of people and it was their kitchen where they would prepare food every day for the homeless people, the people who needed food. And he said, if that cabin can be moved, then I can build them a real kitchen. And then they'll really be able to, you know, cook a lot of meals and help people. So, so I was able to put him in touch <clears throat> with Norm and the Gaitans. And, and I remember he told us that he actually had a cauldron, a big pot that they were using that had been there from the time when it was on the dunes. So I think that went with it. Is that cauldron still on the, in the cabin? I'm not sure. So um, I was able to put everyone in touch with everyone else so that eventually it was moved. And I know they had to do it at night and move the electrical cables so that it could cross the big highway. And it was a you know pretty big deal, but they, that's how they got it done. And I also remember at that time, we took a drive by Dr. Garber's house. So um, that's my story. That's you know how I was able to help and get it where it is today. Bravo. I, I'd like to add, I went, I saw the cabin at about that time and it was, there was a sign saying, just as you are ministries. <laughs> if you remember that, Donald. Uh -huh. <clears throat> um, let's see. <clears throat> so Betty, I have a few pictures to show um, right. before Buzz and Ginger. Is that right? I think the Talbots are going to finish their they're oh, they're still going. Okay. Talk about their, their, All right. um, they have some photos, I think, too. Cool. I think we're all, we're out, we're kind of at contemporary times now. Is that so, Alan and Karen? Do you have further? <clears throat> muted, Karen, you're muted. <clears throat> you, you need to unmute, Karen. <clears throat> oh, I'm in, Alan. I'll be back. <laughs> okay. Your photos, Cassandra, are from when? Just <clears throat> muted. <laughs> I wanted to show photos of the uh, cabin early on during the restoration and then just before Buzz and Ginger got there. And then one of Buzz and Ginger, they're from Mar uh, Marymount website. <clears throat> Did you, Alan, have more to, to say? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, I have one other thing to say. Um, <laughs> I just remembered. Um, it, laughing about the idea of Elizabeth sitting on the cabin floor reading books to um, this child, Ella. I told this to Charles and Wendy, Wendy and they thought it was just they raised their eyebrows. They were laughing too. They couldn't believe, you know, given the elderly Elizabeth, the notion that she would do that. But it was very touching to me. She did love children and pets as well. I just wanted to add it. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> All right. So Cassandra will show photos then. 
Okay. And then we'll go on to Glaskis. <clears throat> So um, this is a, a Elwood Deckwood standing in front of his cabin in the Oceana Dunes. Can you see that? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Can you can you do any bigger or no? No. I don't want to mess He's tiny. Up. He's tiny out in front. There. I know some of these websites are pretty weird. <laughs> the way they have their pictures embedded is hard. But anyway, this is when it uh, first arrived. And, or not when it first arrived, but before they did the full restoration. And then uh, when we have Buzz and Ginger talk in a few minutes, uh, let me see, where is it? Do you see them there? Yeah. So there it is. And there's Buzz in his Baba hat. And they have their, uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, masks because of the fire, they had just left uh, the Mayor Mount area and the fire was sort of still putting out a lot of smoke. This is the Thomas fire in 2017. And I actually got, I actually took this picture. I was there with them after we visited the cabin or just before we visited the cabin. So and Buzz Manager, why don't you pick up from there? If you're still there. <laughs> Hey, Baba. We yeah. always thought we always thought it was kind of cute that the uh, the Christ decided to visit Moimel the day after Christmas, December. <laughs> very <laughs> very clever that guy. And anyway, um, yeah, uh, we should also thank all the people for their hard work to getting that cabin uh, moved uh, to the Oceano Depot because it it really was our oasis after the fire. We, uh, can you be a little bit louder, Buzz? Yeah, I can yeah. move closer to. There you go. Uh, that help? Yeah. So anyway, I was just saying that uh, Oceano mm -hmm. turned out to be our oasis after the Thomas fire. Um, Buzz, I have your pictures, some of which are repeats of those. Would well, you, you like, well, uh, sure, if you want to show the tree, that's fine. All right. Yeah. If you mm -hmm. have, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> but they won't see you. I'll just maybe I'll go through them and then. Then turn it okay, back okay. to you. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. Now the first one. Oh, how do I do this? That's where we camped for three months. Right. Oh, I thought I was gonna. Uh... That's okay. Uh, okay. Just, yeah. Okay. Well. Mm, darn. And the, the first one is the tree, right? That's your... Yeah, but you, you can just show them and I'll talk about them after if you want. All right. Just show them quickly? Sure. Okay. It'd be nice to... Uh, share. Uh, sorry, I'm not able to... Why don't you talk and I'll... Uh, you tell your story, okay. Buzz, and I'll... You're you're better at sharing pictures than I am. That's, that's why I sent them to you. Uh -huh, okay. Anyway, anyway Go ahead and tell the story. After, after the fire and we had to leave Marymount, we spent one night in Ojai, uh, Leslie and Samantha's, and the smoke and the soot and everything that was in the air was really too much. So we moved farther. We went up to Santa Barbara, spent the night there, and the next morning woke up and there was even uh, uh st smoke and soot and all that stuff very uncomfortable so we decided to uh, quite happily uh, end up in oceano which is two and a half hours north of mayhem mount and we we had known about that baba's visit but we we didn't that's all we knew so there's so we got there checked into this rv park in our trailer and when we had to do business, we would just commute down to Mayor Mount and take care of things and then drive back. But anyway, we found this beautiful little place, um, uh, the Oceano Depot Museum, that's only open on Sundays from 12, one, 12 to 3. 12 to 3, three hours a week. So we decided to go over and uh, Mar we, where we met Norm and Mark, who is the docent at the museum. And of course, I had that Baba hat on that, that Cassandra showed. And uh, 
So this guy started giving us a little tour of the museum, and he goes, It's a railroad museum. A railroad museum. And he goes, I don't think you guys are here to see trains. <laughs> and so he said, this is not part of the normal tour, but I'm going to take you over and uh, show you this house. And we're like, what house? And he said, the, the house that Mayor Baba spent the night in. And we were like, we were in heaven. That's all I can say. We forgot all about the fire, all about Mayor Mond, all about everything. And he t gave us this wonderful tour and uh, talked about all the work that he was involved in in getting it moved to this spot. And then the loving uh, dedication into, into restoring this cabin. It's so beautiful. They tried to use the colors that they would have used in those days. That they did use. They did use in those days. And they planted uh, plants that were planted in that area in those days. They just did a wonderful job. So poor Mark, for the next uh, three months that we were there, we would show up on Sundays and he would just be waiting for us and just give us the keys <laughs> to, to Baba's cap. And, and, and we, would just go <laughs> hang, we would just go hang out there until uh, pretty much, he didn't have to kick us out, I no, don't think close. ever. But during that time, we got to hear lots of stories from Norm and uh, talk to Norm. And Norm told us that Baba first came, when he came to Yoshiano, he went to Dr. Garber's house, and or Gerber, and he took them out to Moimel, which means uh, pastures of honey, I believe, Moimel, a Gaelic term. And uh, Pastures of honey. Pastures of honey, yes. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, uh, like I said, we were we were like in heaven for three months. We just had so much fun, felt Baba's presence so strongly. It was just wonderful. And and Mark never bothered us in the cabin. He never brought any other visitors to the museum to the cabin. So I don't know what he thought we were doing in there, but uh, anyway, it was great fun. Well, it's something to say about what he told us about. Earlier, it was said how cold it was, and the Baba was cold being there. And the cabin did have a fireplace, but because it was so um, dangerous, they couldn't light it because right, right. you would not uh, make it through the night if they put that fireplace on. It's a little bit of a backflow. Back, yeah, <laughs> and so that was one reason Baba was so cold. But uh, we, after being there, then we were shared our experiences and. Our friends would come. I think Marta came, yes. and uh, we yeah. did uh, the prayers in the uh, cabin. In the cabin, yeah. and uh, and of course Cassandra was there with us. And uh, Jyoti and Marma and their gang came up one day. So it was it was fun. It was like a, a mini. We opened a mini Mayhem Mount. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that that's really all we have to share. If you want to show those photos, yeah, right, I will try to. Okay. Now. Cool. See where are we? Does it have a picture of Baba in that cabin? Uh, Baba? Uh, yes, it, yes. it shows the photo of Baba in the cabin, one of them. Yes. And then there's a binder also in there. And I, I thought Donna Lynn was responsible for that. It talks about yeah, Baba. Uh, no. It wants Here to. we go. Oh, no. no. Sorry. Um, Loving up here. Let's see. Okay, here's let's let's start with this the tree. You can tell us. Uh, oh, I love the tree. Here we go. All right. Yep, that's Bobby's oh. tree. This is what we found. Uh, we were able to get into Marymount two days two after, days after, after the, the fire. fire. So we had driven back down from uh, uh, Oceano, and this this is what we found. Yeah. Okay, I'll just I'll go try to go through these quickly. Okay. You can let give us a. Okay. Uh, and that's the little park they built, and of course there's the cabin in the background. Mm -hmm. It's lovely. They did a lovely job. All right. Oh, let's see. One minute. And then we'll. Buzz, remind me what town the cabin is sitting in now that we what? just saw. 
What town? O Oceano. Oceano. Aha. Uh -huh. Thank you. Sure. And that's just the view from where we parked for three months. <laughs> Beautiful. Tough life, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and a I think um, well, while you're looking well, at it, I had another memory of, um, I think it was the last time that we were able to be there and, and Mark, as I said, the docent, um, he showed us the, the corner of the cabin and he said, this is where the bed was when they lost Oh, slept. yes, that's right, that's right. We're trying to point that out in one of the pictures. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Ginger, which corner is it when you walk through the front door since I was there? Which corner was it? Well, you, the back. You, walk, you walked in and it was kind of the porch and then you, you yeah. walked into the, the main thing. Just yeah. right there on the left. On the left. Oh, yeah. great. Thank you. Okay. This is, isn't that gorgeous? Wow. Yeah. Wow. All right. And maybe I'll do one more of the uh, cabin. Can you put that in an email, that picture? Ah, it's so beautiful. Is that okay, Vlaskis? <laughs> the one with the scenery, the. You have to ask the photographer. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Oh, come on. This is all. <laughs> Who's this? The tree, too. <laughs> Uh, sorry, one more. Uh, this is the house. Yeah, who's that? That, that is, is Mark. Mark. Uh, Mark, is the, the Mark is the docent and a real trained guy, uh -huh. but with a big heart. He he put up with us so he was so <laughs> nice to us. <laughs> uh, boy, doesn't it look spiffed up? Wow, they've yeah. done a good job. Yeah. Okay, you know. Uh, I think, uh, let's see, you have a, is there, I, well, let's see, but anyway, um, the fact that Gavin Arthur's cabin was the only one that survived out there on the dunes uh, makes you think that Baba was, you know, prescient <laughs> when he chose to, that one. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. So here's a little drawing of Moy Mel. Um, let's see. Maybe was that an Elwood Decker? I wonder. Oh, from the dune. Well, anyway, yeah. Of the at the time. That's 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 that uh, photo. That's in uh, Gavin's cabin now. So if you go there, you'll see that on the wall. Oh, you mean like the original? Uh, no, I, I'm not sure yeah. if it's the original or not. But looks like Norm Hammond had something to do with it in '92. Uh -huh. Right. So, Betty, which one of those houses did Bob end up staying in? Gavin's. 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 Oh. And the guest cabin was the one they made for him? I don't know. It might have been. I don't know about that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, I guess at this, thank you, everybody. Um, we can open. We can open up for actual back and forth questions if you'd like. And, you know, we, we all agree that we'd love to have Norm, Norm himself come, uh, but we've had a week to get this together. <laughs> so we'll, we will, we'll try. We'll let you know. It's, and, you know, another, another character that should be part of this is Paul Williams, who worked with Valerie and Norm and uh, has a, but he's in Australia as well. So we'll see what we can do next time. About I don't, I don't have a question, but I, I have a, I wanted to say something. Okay. Um, as far as Elizabeth sitting on the ground reading a story, I could very well see that. Anyone that her Charles and Wendy called her Auntie Boo. Come on. And and when I was having dinner with her, she she let the turtle up on the table, Jimmy up on the table. So she was not like yeah. Miss Queen. And also I would say about Agnes Barron, let me read her children's stories. She had that wonderful childlike side. So, you know, these people were not like 
real box type people. I mean, Elizabeth went to the North Pole or, you know, I mean, it's like, uh, and also it's funny, they traveled across the US when she, Narina's giving her talks and they were wearing jeans in that picture, early jeans. <laughs> and they, they had a tent and they used to camp out. That's not, you know, you don't confine these people. Yeah, no. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you, Rosa. Yeah. Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Tell me what else? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead. Right. Is oh, there yeah. anyone else who has a question or a comment they want to add? No, Shawan, do you have anything you'd like to add? I'd love to hear from you. No, I've never been there. Oh, he's no, 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 Shawan. No, Shawan. No, Shawan. He's not here anymore. <laughs> He was trying to unmute. I think he. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Yeah. I uh, I have yeah, a, I have uh, an excerpt from Adike Irani's diary, if you'd like to hear that, of his uh, accompanying Baba to the dunes. Perfect. Absolutely. Yeah. So it says we started for the dunes in three cars driven by Elizabeth, Margaret, and a driver of a two-seater car. We arrived there at about 3.30 p.m. Baba, Chanji, Kaka, Jal, and myself slept in a small cottage, and the rest slept in the other two structures. The night was cold. The dunes is a secluded spot and resembles a desert and is populated by a few people who do not care for worldly possessions and live a life of contentment, happiness, humility, and meditation. One Sam Cohen is an exceptionally ascetic type of man with no regards for clothes. He wears a sweater and covers himself with newspapers at night. Dr. Rudolf Gerber, Patron of the Dunes colony and his wife is his helpmate. Marion Thorpe stays in a cottage which Baba stopped at. One of the persons called Hugo is interested in the higher consciousness and Baba explained to him the conflict that he had in his mind and the three qualities of Rajas, Tamas and Sattva. Uh, now, this is a little uh, on Thursday, the 27th, 1934. This uh, uh, is focused. Th there was a lot going on in India at that time. Uh, there was the, the Dandi March and the breaking of the salt tax law, and there was tremendous amount of disturbance in India. So this is related to Adi's question to Baba about India. Baba, in an answer to my query, gave a very illuminating explanation about the best condition in which India exists. Ruled by Britain, it has no worry of possession and fear of losing it. There are many factions in India. Hindus and Mohammedans are not united. Swaraj to India, Swaraj means freedom, to India gave no scope of spiritual advancement. China is independent but chaotic. Materially speaking, India is not likely to be benefited by independence. We left the dunes at about 3.30, but due to rains and the tide, the cars got stuck in sand and it took us some time before we could reach the town of Oceano. We drove down to Hollywood and arrived uh, at 12.30 after midnight. So this is a little excerpt from Adi's 1934 diary. But if those who have read the, uh, uh, the 2005, February 2005 issue of The Globe, uh, which uh, we, uh, I, uh, I have, I, after that, I was in correspondence with Norm Hammond, who had shown us around uh, Baba's cabin and so forth. And, and Alan, Alan and Alan Talbot has already mentioned about our visit there. Uh, there's something I wanted to point out, which, uh, uh, which I think uh, was uh, was questioned. 
It's about Sam Cohen. Sam recorded several trips to see Meher Baba, one to England and another to India and to Cannes, France. The story of Sam's nocturnal visit to Dr. Gerber's home sets the date of Sam's departure soon after a visit to the dunes. It is probable that Sam was on his way to visit Baba in England, as Sam did not arrive in India until 1937 in the Nasik ashram. At Nasik, Mayor Baba ordered Sam to spend the night in the cave in Tiger Valley at Panchkani, at a spot that had been given to Baba by the Maharaja of Savantwadi. The cave was dug at Baba's order. But Sam was afraid to stay in the cave alone overnight. But then uh, it goes on to say that Mayor Baba then sang sent Sam to travel to Europe via Colombo, uh, Ceylon, from there to reunite with Baba in Cannes, France, where three villas had been engaged for monthly members. On October 25, 1937, Baba sent Sam Cohen from Cannes to Mexico. The why and wherefore of Sam's visit to Mexico are unknown, but we can assume that Mayor Baba was using Sam as a conduit for his work. Uh, then um, it says that 19 years passed before Sam was to see Meher Baba again. Sam was living in New York and often attended the established Monday night meetings. His reunion with the beloved occurred during Meher Baba's second visit to Meher, ba Meher Center in Myrtle Beach in 1956. At Meher Center, Sam posed the following question to Baba. Suppose one feels that meditating by oneself is service. I like to visit the Monday group, but not all the time. So Baba replied to Sam, I would like you all to belong to certain groups. Why? Because you can cooperate and tell others about me and share your thoughts. You learn much more than when you remain by yourself. When you listen, Exchange thoughts, prayers, my presence is there. Where there, are fire collect, where, where there are five collected together, there is Parmeshwar, Supreme God. I am there. If you're talking of me, having love for me, then there, is, there I am. Is this all clear to you? And then... Uh, And then, of course, uh, Valerie mentions about Sam Cohn's stay at the center for two months. Um, Sam Cohen remained devoted to Baba until the end of his life. Uh, and then um, this is, I don't know whether this was read, uh, Betty, uh, earlier, but it's a letter of January 4th, 1984, addressed to Adele Walken and written by Faye Fisher. No? Okay, do you want me to read it? Okay. Sam Cohen remained devoted to Baba until the end of his life. The following excerpt is from a letter of January 4, 1984, addressed to Adele Walken and written by Faye Fisher, who lived in the same building as Sam in New York City. And this is the letter. It's, uh, it's a little long. Sam lived in my building the last couple of years before dropping his body. I used to do his shopping and did a little cooking. Sam was a very private person. He very seldom spoke about Mer Baba except when he told me about the dunes. He claimed being in a very lonely spot with all kinds of wild creatures around him. He asked Baba why he wanted him there and Baba replied, you will find out. Sam told me he had some marvelous mystical experiences. And when I asked to explain, he would not go into details. He was really a very difficult person in some ways. However, we did get along very well. Now about my dream. Sam had a heart condition for many years. Evidently, it wasn't too bad except for the last couple of years before his death. He had been in and out of the hospital. He had short stays several times. The last time he went to the hospital, he decided to give up his room in my building so that he would save the rent, not knowing when he would be discharged from the hospital. 
However, when he returned, there was no vacancy here. So he found another place nearby. When I went to visit him, he said he was fine. That was that very same night in a dream, I saw Meher Baba. It was so vivid and real. Baba commanded me to go and see Sam and to tell him that he, Baba, was coming to see him. That was all. The next morning, I ran to Sam's place and gave him the message. Sam was so grateful, happy, and elated. He made me dine with him that evening. Somehow, this message, it seemed to me, made him concentrate on Baba more than he had recently. The very next day, I received a phone call telling me that Sam had died. I didn't know I would be able to write as I'm still feeling the effects of this experience, but everything and this is beloved Baba's doing. This was a very touching uh, uh, note about Sam Cohen. And then uh, somewhere along the lines in, in, in one of the issues of the GLOW, we carried an article by Sam Cohen, which had the title, His Hand Clasp. Uh, I forget which issue it was, but in which he describes his meeting Baba. And his first meeting was in, um, uh, in California at the, at the, um, in Hollywood. And then the next meeting was in 1934 at the Sand Dunes. And he discovered, he writes about, he writes about how uh, he was arrested for uh, picking up clams without a permit and how he was fined and that Norina Machiavelli paid the fine and so forth. So he describes that in that article. But he was a very interesting character. Do you happen to have that article handy? I think I could play. If, I have that article, but it's, uh, it's, uh, um, it's this long, it's a long <laughs> okay. one. So uh, I don't know whether you want me to read parts of it. Maybe, an, yeah, an excerpt. Uh, or do you, could you just identify one? Identify an excerpt that would okay. describe the hand clasp? Uh, yeah. Uh, after this article was published, Phyllis Frederick wrote to me saying, what on earth made you put this title of his hand clasp? And I, and I wrote back to Phyllis. I said, Phyllis, that seemed to be the turning point for Sam Cohen. That's why. It was in the spring of 1932 in California that I was given the privilege of meeting Mayor Baba. I was permitted only a moment with him as hundreds of people were eager to meet him. When I entered the room, I saw a very happy and smiling person seated in front of me. The first impression was of consummate graciousness and love combined. Baba merely clasped my hand and gazed at me. The hand clasp of a master is not a mere hand clasp, nor is his game, uh, nor is his gaze just to look at you, but by his touch and look, he tends the veil and sometimes completely removes the veil which separates man from divinity. About 200 miles north of Hollywood, there is a place called the Sand Dunes. Running for about 12 miles along the sea coast, these dunes stretch in a series of sand hills, giving one the impression of a desert. I decided to visit this place for a short while and then to move on. About a quarter of a mile in from the beach and behind the sand hills, there are green coves each secluded in its own valley by surrounding dunes so that they cannot be seen from the beach. When I arrived there, I discovered to my surprise the group of people living here in one of the caves, all excited with the coming of Mayor Baba and were all thrilled by the strange events told them by one of Baba's disciples who had been there. <coughs> It was surprising to see how these people, very young and individualistic, and who seldom could get together to cooperate without friction, suddenly fell into a line and, and were ready to undertake any kind of work that they had never been accustomed to doing. And community life 
which previously among these inspire, aspiring artists and poets was impossible, now became very harmonious. They had settled down to six weeks of meditation and work. The place was highly energized and a power poured through from Meher Baba, who although he had gone back to India, was actually working through the people here. And he felt as near to him as though his actual physical presence was here. When the disciple of Baba left the dunes and many of the people had gone their way, I decided to remain and get to the bottom of this living philosophy, which to me had become the dynamics of life. I moved down the dunes about a mile and a half into one of these coves. I built a shack, dug a well, and settled down to a life of meditation. It was here I read of Mer Baba's remarkable explanation on the path that leads to God consciousness. So this is Sam Cohen. Thank you so much, Nasir. Baba. That's a perfect place to uh, to end this. I mean, this part of the meeting, anyway. Where there is a little more time, but that's perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nasir. People are welcome to stay and chat some more, but we'll stop the recording. I think Ralph Jackson raised his hand. Oh, okay. Ralph? Who was the author of that last article, please? I missed that. The Sam, Sam, wrote Cohen, that last wrote article. Sam Cohen was the author of the article. Oh, he wrote it. Yes, for the Globe. I see. Wow. Uh, thank you, Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Okay, now Wayne has a question. We'll, we'll record a little longer. <laughs> Wayne? I actually have a, a, a footnote tidbit about Gavin Arthur um, from an experience. And um, just to add, it's not, it's a little story, but it, it, it's interesting to me. I heard of Baba in Berkeley in 1971 in the, in the summer, fall. And um, I, uh, I was living in a hippie commune and there was Baba's pictures everywhere. And they were kind of the hippie kind of Baba lovers, you know, uh, <laughs> and uh, it was all new to me, but I was very with it and in, in, in getting into it. I didn't know a lot about Baba yet. I went to India a year later. Anyway, October of 71, a group of us piled into a hippie van and we were went up to a, a winery in Napa Valley to hear this, this old man talk. His name was Gavin Arthur. And um, I didn't know anything about him, but he was uh, apparently an astrologer, a mystic, and he had apparently had connections to the gay rights movement. And some of us were involved in that, as was I, because he had known Edward Carpenter, and Edward Carpenter had known Walt Whitman, and on and on. so there was all these connections made. But anyway, um, on the way up in our hippie van, it completely died. We were stranded on the side of the road out in the country somewhere between Vallejo and Napa. And um, so, and this, I remember this really well. So, and we couldn't get it started. <clears throat> we were clueless. So we, um, we, we opened the hood of the van. We all stood around holding hands and we <laughs> sang, don't worry, be happy, Mayor Baba loves us all. Illusions are many and underneath them all. And to our dear friend, Jenny Zinner, who wrote that, um, which I didn't know until later. Uh, and uh, we did that about three times and it started and we got there. But anyway, <laughs> so we got there and um, it was out in the winery. And I remember um, him sitting and he was, to me, I was only 18, very elderly, but he was probably in his 70s. Uh, he might have even been in a wheelchair, but he was elderly and seemed frail. And there were what I called a bunch of little old ladies, you know, spiritual type little old ladies there was a small group and he was giving a talk and we kind of stayed in the background and kind of danced around and did our hippie thing. And I never gave much thought to that until later on, uh, years later when I was reading that Gavin Arthur had met Mayor Baba and Baba had stayed in his house in California. And I thought, wow. <laughs> and then I looked him up and he had died six months after that. Uh, in April of 72. And it just sort of thought to me, well, here were these, um, I don't know what Baba was doing with that, that little moment, but it was kind of like, you know, the Bohemian Baba people of then were kind of 
making a circle with the Bohemian Baba people, so to speak, of that time, and all unbeknownst to me. One of those Baba stories that you comes to light later on, which has a meaning only Baba knows. Jay Baba, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Wayne. <laughs> I think I think many of us have had connections to Oceano like that. You know, somehow we that interest sparked. I, I know we we happened to wind up camping there uh, because all the campgrounds were full. And uh, what I remember about that on our way to L.A. Sahabas, and uh, I remember the energy was absolutely wild. It was just before the Fourth of July. That was remarkable. I mean, but it was more than. Fourth of July, people were staking claims out on the sand to stay, and uh, it was just wind. Yeah, very windy and just wild. A wild energy about that place. Yeah. So, any other comments from folks? <clears throat> I wanted to say something, Betty. Yeah. Um, this is about the only claim to fame that my husband, who is a, I call him a, a veiled Baba lover has, is that he was born on Christmas in 1934 in Santa Barbara at the hospital, which was quite close to the highway that Mayor Baba drove up and down. So I always have this vision of Baba driving through Santa Barbara and um, sending Elliot a message you know, don't worry, you'll hear about me at some point in your life and up and back. And so I always thought that was important, even though my husband might not think it's that important. <laughs> oh, thank you, Donna. I sure appreciate your telling about your 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 part in this. <laughs> it seems like all of us have an interest from various various points points. Betty, Betty could I ask a question? It's Marta. Yeah. Did, does anyone did Baba drive through Santa Barbara to get there and drive through Santa Barbara to get back? Because I had heard that he drove back through a different route. Does anybody know that? Boy, you know, Valerie would be your person. I, I don't know if she knows that detail. Are you here, Valerie? I don't know anybody else who would know. Yeah. <clears throat> I think it was called the Roosevelt Highway at one point, which was the Highway 101 from LA to sent to Ocean, would go through Oceano. I know they took that route going up. I don't know what route they took going back. Can I get some coffee? I would assume, I don't know, Marta, I think it might just be, that would make the most sense for them to go up Highway 1, I think. It's just funny that I have in my mind, Buzz, did you have it? Did you tell me that, that, he, that they had gone back through another route back to LA? I must have heard it somewhere. Did you know anything about that? I do remember reading something about it in Lord Mayhair, but okay, I, I, don't, I do not remember. But 101 and Highway 1 are very different routes. So- Well, uh, I must mean 101 then. Yeah. Yeah, one comes through Santa Barbara, 101 is more inland. You know, another oh. source, sorry, another source of information is the Awakener. And I didn't get a chance to go back and look at the online Awakener, but uh, Phyllis, uh, uh, I know she tells some, she quotes Sam um, telling about his experience, I think, believe on, on some kind of a, a, a spiritual experience on Mount, uh, to do with Mount Abu. Anyway, so that's if anybody's interested in looking. Well, Valerie would probably know. Uh, there's more, there's information there too. I will say that if you get a chance to check the Avatar Mayor Baba Trust website, there's 20 letters and telegrams from Sam Cohen there and um, quite a few from Norena and Elizabeth that are very interesting. Thanks everybody for coming. I, I knew this would be a good meeting. I think there's a lot of energy and interest around and we will definitely uh, put the word out if we can get Norm Hammond to come.
Uh, Eddie, so, I wanted to share too. Yeah. I wanted to share. Yeah. It's a, okay. Okay. a very ex now, Californian. Uh, I love this. This is from uh, Ashmir. It's Baba speaking through Narina. And it says, his divine mind is making motion. It is like the wind that blows over the ocean. It creates waves, bubbles, deep subterranean earthquakes. It reacts in the deep show of life, in reaction infinite, and in the dual life of men in self-expression. So, you know, all this, you know, it's so engaging because God man was here and is manifesting. Yeah, Dave Baba. So true, Rosalie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Deep subterranean earthquakes. Okay, then anybody else? Thank you, Betty, for doing all this. Thank everybody. Oh, it was, it was a it was so much fun because it was there's obviously the energy was there. People were just just happy to participate. Valerie, big thanks to you for coming. Oh, you, yeah. <laughs> thanks a lot for joining. Thank you. Me. It was wonderful to join you. All right. This will. I soon love you. those tunes. You know. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. We all do. It's such a magical, mystical place. Yeah. What's the name of that dune? <laughs> I don't think each one had a name. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then I'll say Avatar Meher Baba Ki Jay. You can also say Avatar Meher Baba Ki Jay. Avatar Meher Baba Ki Jay. All right, and I'll stop recording and. Uh,